and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you to the generous underwriters of Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information and Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Thursday, August 3rd, we are studying Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 to 17. In today's text, Solomon sees the vanity in this life under the sun from his experiences of chasing after pleasure. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us returning guest, Pastor Vance Becker. Pastor Becker is an LCMS missionary to Kenya. He serves as theological educator at Nima Lutheran College in Matongo, Kenya. Pastor Becker, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Thank you. I enjoy being with you. Pastor Becker, tell us a little bit about the work you're doing there in Kenya. How are things going? I think things are going well. We are between semesters, and so we, we have just a few students here right now for some special classes. Um, and so we're working on some other things. I just today uh, looked at the list of those who are registered for fall semester so far, and it looks like we will have more incoming than uh, graduating. So that's a good thing. We need more and more pastors. Fantastic. God be praised. And when does the fall semester start there? Uh, last week of August. Okay. All right. So similar. Is that that's you're pretty well on a similar schedule to the the schools in in the United States. Yeah. You know, different schools are different here. The the uh, primary schools are in session. Um, oh. The teachers' college connected to us is not on the same schedule as us. Um, but we uh, are more or less on what you're familiar with with an academic schedule there. Very good, very good. Well, God be praised for all the work that's being done there in Kenya. And our prayers continue to be with you and other missionaries spreading God's word in Kenya and throughout Africa. So, Pastor Becker, we get Ecclesiastes chapter 2, part of it today. Talk to us a little bit about the book of Ecclesiastes. I feel like we've been doing all kinds of different sorts of literature here on Sharper Iron. We were in Revelation, we've looked at Psalms, now we're in Ecclesiastes. What do we need to know about this book as we approach it today? Okay, I'm going to assume that that your guest from yesterday on chapter 1 talked about a lot of this stuff, so I'm not going to go into much depth and detail. Um I will just comment that uh, some suggest that Solomon writes this as one who has very foolishly pursued various things in his young life, has learned that that's, that's not what gives life meaning. He's learned otherwise. He's, he's now older and wiser, um, has learned his lesson. Uh, I can't prove this, but I actually have a, a little bit different theory. Um, uh, I think that, that he actually was already very wise. That was indicated when he first became uh, a king. Um, I'm going to suggest this book is something like a research paper in which he uh, lays out a thesis um, that earthly things are vanity, then does research to test his thesis and proves it correct. Um, so anyway, that's that's sort of a, a theory that I, that I have. Um, and uh, I will say, also, he talks a lot, it, famously, even people who don't know much at all about Ecclesiastes know vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Um, w- what is vanity? Uh, I, I will comment, one of the things I try to do here with my students, because they come from many countries, is use as simple English as possible and avoid words that, what does that mean? Uh, I would say vanity, another word, is worthlessness. But I, I don't think it means totally without any kind of worth or value. Simply, it means that it does not have, it does not provide lasting satisfaction. It is empty in the long run. It, 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 it is not that which does not give ultimate meaning or value to life. Uh, I think there is ultimate meaning and value to life. It says that it does not come from any of these things. Okay. And, and I um, think that's, I think that's helpful that, I mean, because when you read Ecclesiastes, it's pretty jarring, like meaningless or vanity, worthless, futile, some other English words that are used in translations. So, 
Solomon doesn't have a, an entirely hopeless or despairing outlook. No, I don't think that's true. And like I said, my theory is he knows ahead of time, uh, but he's you know simply doing, demonstrating by research, it's not this. Um, now, it's outside the scope of the particular verses we're looking at today, but he does in this book reveal that while it's not anything we ourselves do that provides real meaning, it is, there is real meaning, however, in what God himself does for us. And I would draw that contrast, not what we do, but what God does for us, um, which is, that's, I'm constantly talking about that in all theology. It's not about what we do, it's about what God does for us, um, including the work God gives us to do and the pleasure that God gives us to enjoy. And he said, that is good and enjoyable. Uh, and I would say, he also hints here, in these verses already, uh, by the way he says things, that the value is not anything we do for ourselves. Uh, the way he says things, he, he, you know, I did this I, you know, for myself. I think that uh, is in contrast, even though it's not expressed explicitly, uh, to what we do for others. And I think the, the thing is, is what we do for ourselves, no, no, no real value in that. It's what we do for others' benefit that produces real value to them. And this fits with what Luther points out regarding good works. They're not for our benefit, they're for our neighbor's benefit. And I think that that is what Solomon is saying here um, about uh, all the things that, that we do. I, I appreciate you talking about the benefit for the neighbor as opposed to the benefit for ourselves in that contrast, because we, we talked a little bit about that yesterday, actually, in the, the end of chapter one, that that's probably something that's going on. So we should keep that in mind as well as, well as we look at this part of chapter two today. So let's go ahead and read the text. This is Ecclesiastes 2, beginning at verse one. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works, I built houses and planted vineyards for myself, I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and have slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the children of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. So I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly, for what can the man do who comes after the king? only what has already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceived that the same event happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated life, because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity and a striving after wind. That's our text for today. It's Ecclesiastes 2, verses 1 to 17. All right, so, Pastor Becker, you suggested that we might think of Ecclesiastes somewhat like a research paper where Solomon puts forth a thesis, he tests it, and he proves it. How do we see that, that sort of structure, at least in the first verse or so of this text? Uh, I would say he's laying out here the, the various things 
and that he's saying, okay, the value is not in these things. And he's got a, a list here. Um, now, I will say not being Solomon, what I'm going to talk about is not only my own wisdom. <laughs> I've used some various resources, uh, pulled out some things that look interesting to me. Um, I know Lutheran Study Bible uh, uses these terms for the things he lists. He examines wisdom, and that especially in, in chapter 1, which is past. Then uh, non-reason, the opposite. Pleasure, two kinds of pleasure, sensual pleasure, and, and what LSB calls aesthetic pleasure. That is, the, the enjoyment of, of creative work, enjoying fine things. Uh, then also collecting. Uh, some, some, uh, some like doing that. Uh, I, I confess to some hoarding tendencies myself. Uh, and activism, you know, the things you do. So uh, projects. So th those are the various kinds of things in the list. All right. So into verse one, Solomon starts like this. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. This sounds kind of like a summary of the first part. Yes. And uh, let me let me just pick this up. A few comments on, on this section of the whole. You know, he calls himself the preacher. Um, and uh, one of the things I noted was that... that uh, He's preaching both law and gospel, and I'm always after my homiletic students. You've got to have both law and gospel all the time. This section is law. You got to have that. It's, it's saying, "Oh, this is the bad news. This is what's not any good," and you have to accept the truth of the law before you're ready for the gospel. He's not getting into that here yet. Um, he talks about wisdom. True wisdom is seeing our need for God, but then also trusting Him for our salvation. And that salvation, or well, that same wisdom, also leads us to sanctification. And it's the area of sanctification, especially, that we're relating to in this part. Um, we're seeing how life is rightly used and rightly valued. Um, the other thing to note here is that uh, this is based on observation. He says, this is what I see. This is not, this is not uh, philosophical so much as, as I see this. That's not all of truth. There is more wisdom. He knows that very well. Um, and wisdom is more than just knowing how to do things. It's knowing the right things to do. Um, wisdom is good. He knows that. But it has limits. Uh, it can lead us to what's good. Uh, but also, as we learn, um, wisdom can make us sad. <laughs> you know, oh, I wish I didn't know that. You know, my experience sees me things makes me sad. Uh, ultimately, the wisdom is in Jesus Christ. But again, that's it's outside of this text. So mm. now he talks about pleasure. He says here in verse one, I said in my heart, come now. This reminds me of, uh, you know, the, the story of the rich fool um, who says to himself. So, so he speaks to himself. Solomon's speaking to himself. Uh, that's a way of saying this is what I've decided to do. Um, it's not split personality or anything like that. Um, now, Pleasure. What is what is this? Well, first of all, he uh, he's gonna. I'm gonna test you with pleasure. The word here uh, in the original can be translated to pour out. Um, in this particular form, it means to test, and that's where I'm saying it's sort of like a research project. I'm I'm gonna test this. Um, although he's testing this not so much pleasure as his reaction to pleasure. Um, what's it going to to do for me? Um, and what he tries is happiness, it is joy, uh, it is gladness, um, and uh, there, as I, as I come before in, in the list from LSB, different kinds of pleasure. There's the, there's the physical pleasure uh, that he's going to talk about, and then there's the, the enjoyment of the things he does and value in those things. Uh, I'll just comment, Luther says, Solomon is not condemning enjoying yourself. That's not bad. He makes that clear. It's not wrong to be happy. It's simply pursuing it on our own agenda by our own efforts rather than according to what God gives us and he wills it. Um, Bolenhagen wrote the Concordia Commentary series on this. And he also says enjoyments are they're to be enjoyed. That's what they're for. Trying to get some benefit out of them turns them into work. And I thought that was an interesting comment. Um, a glad heart comes from enjoy, not just from enjoying things, but from recognizing them as gifts from God. 
And there is some real value to see, ah, this shows that God loves me. This shows, you know, God's goodness. And that's as good as anything that we would enjoy for ourselves. Um, Bolenhagen also makes this comment, which I noted. Um, in these things, Solomon is not mentioning relationships with others. He's not, he talks about enjoying these things for himself. He's not talking about enjoying them in the context of enjoying being with others. And he notes that's the problem. That's a misuse of enjoyable things to think they're enjoyable. They're to be enjoyed by myself rather than for the purpose of enjoying being with others. You know, the, the way that you made a connection to the parable of the rich fool that Jesus tells, it was it struck me a little bit yesterday as well, that there's a couple of occasions where Solomon does talk a lot about things that, that he did. He uses I, me, my, those first-person pronouns regularly, and you, you pointed that out here again. And and I wonder if there is something something to that, that if, if Solomon were to go the direction of this vanity, that's where he winds up, is the just where the rich fool is. But you rather, know, the book of right. Ecclesiastes will point us in the right direction so that we do have the, the proper fear of God, so we don't take these things in the direction of the rich fool. Mm-hmm. So, uh, shall, we talk, shall I talk about verse 2 then? Go right ahead, sir. Okay. So, so he says of laughter. Now, what's laughter here? Um, the, what resources I'm using are telling me that, that this is like superficial fun, you know, uh, laughing it off like, like when you make fun of someone or you're just laughing because of a game. Um, you know, there's, there's different kinds of laughter. There's the happy laughter, and then there's the derisive laughter. And this seems to be talking about the derisive laughter. Um, uh, uh, There's a different, but pleasure, he talks about laughter, and then he talks about pleasure. What's the difference? Pleasure is a term um, that is used for for thoughtful enjoyment. It's even used about religious festivals. You know, it's pleasing, it's enjoyable. Um, uh, The the laughter, another way to translate it is is madness. It's it's crazy and senseless. uh, but both of them, both that, that derisive, you know, crazy laughter and also the, the thoughtful enjoyment, neither of them have the lasting value that you really want. Um, chapter 3, there is a place for laughter. Um, there's a time for that. But laughter for its own sake, uh, as a goal, that's where there's, there's pointless. Hmm. All right, so laughter is mad, pleasure, what use is it? Solomon then in verse 3, he searches with his heart how to cheer his body with, with wine. Now he's, he's looking for pleasure in wine. What's happening now? Okay, I think that's that, that, that crazy kind of, you know, uh, fun and, and you know, physical pleasure. Um, and uh, uh, he, he's exploring the pleasures of different senses, but, but he makes the, the comment... Uh, my wisdom being in me. I think what he's telling us is he's not just going out to get drunk. Uh, and this is, this is why I'm thinking he, he knows what he's doing. He's testing things. Um, he's not just letting himself go um, uh, totally. Um, and uh, he, he's, he's taking hold of foolishness. He uses the term he's taking hold of foolishness uh, in order to understand it, to comprehend it. Um, later on, he writes about the dangers of being drunk, like in Proverbs. Uh, but he's not saying you have to totally abstain. He's not saying it's, drinking is wrong altogether. Um, he's just saying, nope, uh, you test it. Uh, you know, make sure you don't fall in um, and find, nope, that's, that's not it. Um, so, so I think that's, that's what's happening here. All right, so he tests wine, not to the point of drunkenness, and it seems that he kind of already knows what he's going to receive, but he's testing these things. In verse 4, then, he starts to describe some of the great building projects that he built over his lifetime. What's happening here? Okay, so we're turning a corner. You know, we try this kind of, you know, just the fun stuff. Now we're going on to the next kind of enjoyment, the enjoyment of doing things, uh, projects. And... Um, I'm going to suspect that you, like me, enjoy projects, uh, working on things. Uh, that, that I, that's what I enjoy doing. I get involved in a project and I don't want to do anything else. 
Um, and I think Solomon enjoyed projects, especially building projects. Boy, he had a lot of them too. Um, I think he was really into that. Houses and vineyards. Um, uh, we know the, the house he built for God, the house he built for himself, the various houses for his various wives. Um, and uh, then then vineyards. Uh, and it sort of, there's, there could be a sort of a progression here. Um, let me tie that together with gardens. That's, that's not just vineyards or vegetable gardens, but, but pleasure gardens. You know, in the ancient East, uh, picture Babylon, uh, the, the powerful men, they, they would do this. It was a common thing. You'd have these great pleasure gardens you build for yourself. Uh, we can even think of, you know, like, like the English gardens, the French gardens, you know, that, that are built, uh, very elaborate, that kind of thing. And, uh, and parks, um, and then also all kinds of fruit trees. Okay, those are more you know beneficial. Um, if I can jump ahead, then pools. Okay, you need those to water the gardens. Um, and uh, in fact, later on in the Bible, it mentions some pools in Jerusalem that are understood to have been built by Solomon for the purpose of watering things. Um, he goes on to mention forests. Uh, okay, yeah, you got to have forests for all these building projects. It, uh, and you've got to, those are not the parks, but uh, you got to have water then to water these forests. So, so one project leads to another. You might find that for yourself too. Um, so, so he tries these various, these various kinds of projects that are interesting to him. Okay. So talk through some of the progression of these projects. You mentioned several of them. Is there a progression in the way that they're listed there in verses four and following? Yeah, I would suggest, well, actually, I, I think Bolenhagen is the one who makes this suggestion that, that yeah, uh, you start with, you know, the, the, uh, the houses and, and the vineyards um, and the gardens. So those are like different kinds of projects. Um, and then, but then if you can do that, well, then you also need the pools. So that comes next to water them. And then he sort of seems to mix them together because he starts with houses and he ends with trees. Well, maybe this is, and, and it's a very Hebraic thing to do. This is A, B, B, A uh, pattern. <laughs> um, the trees you need for the houses. Um, and in between, you got the different kinds of plantings and, and the pools. All right, so we're seeing a picture of Solomon's great wealth. And there's this pleasure of building projects as opposed to that personal physical pleasure. Is this going to satisfy him? But before he begins to draw any conclusions, he does keep talking about things that he has continued to acquire for himself. And it takes a turn that maybe surprises and shocks us. In verse 7, he talks about slavery. Yeah, that's true. Uh, let me just comment. Uh, I keep catching myself and going back. Before we go on, notice in verse 5, I made myself gardens. Um, that's where I'm seeing some of the things he does for himself, um, as opposed to things I'm doing for the benefit of others. And that's where the meaninglessness is, in things done for self. Um, and, you know, things for our own benefit. Um, one thing about these gardens, a, a term of... A, a, of, at that time was was uh, paradise. And I think that might be the term that's used here. I'm not sure. Um, that brings to mind Garden of Eden. The, the ultimate value is not in anything that we can create, but it, it comes finally in God's recreation of everything on this earth. You know, there, there is the ultimate value. There is paradise restored. Because um, all of his accomplishments are, are small, small compared to God's. Um, now, verse, uh, verse 7, uh, male and female slaves. I would just say that the Bible talks a lot about slaves. Um, it, it was a fact of all of life, you know, in, in the cultures at that time. It was a fact in Israel. Um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the Pentateuch condemns slavery of fellow Israelites. Uh, it does not explicitly condemn slavery of others. And these male and female slaves apparently were, you know, from other, other countries and, and other cultures, in addition to those born in his house. 
you know, if you're a slave and you have a child, that slave also, that child also is a slave. We see this hinted at in New Testament. Uh, there are some slaves who came to faith. Paul knew them. They have names like number two, <laughs> useful, Onesimus. Um, yeah, you can tell they were born as slaves. That's why they're given names like this. Uh, uh, I don't know that, that uh, Abraham had slaves, but this those born in his house, there is a place where Abraham, Genesis refers to Abraham having men who were born in his house. So they were part of his household because they were born to his, his servants. Um, by app applying things for us today, um, I think we can take the, the prohibition of enslaving fellow Israelites, that is, fellow people of God, um, and apply that today also. No slavery at all. Let's, let's treat everyone as children of God, um, even though, yes, the Old Testament does recognize it as a, as a fact of life. Um, should I go on? Actually, we're coming up on our break. But before we go to break, I had this comment that I've read about slavery from an early church father named Gregory of Nyssa. I found his thoughts very helpful. He put it like this. Gregory of Nyssa said, When someone turns the property of God into his own property and arrogates dominion to his own kind, so as to think himself the owner of men and women, what is he doing but overstepping his own nature through pride, regarding himself as something different from his subordinates? Again, I thought that was a helpful comment on this passage in Ecclesiastes from Gregory regarding the way we as Christians can think about slavery as something we shouldn't be engaging in. With that quote from Gregory of Nyssa in mind, we're going to go ahead and take our break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We're talking to Pastor Vance Becker this morning about Ecclesiastes chapter 2. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Lutheran Church Extension Fund exists to support Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and church workers. How do we do this? Your investment with LCEF makes it possible for LCMS churches, schools, organizations, and church workers to receive low-cost loans for new and growing ministries. And faithful Lutherans like you, church members and church workers alike, make that possible when you invest with LCEF. Learn more at lcef.org. LCF is a nonprofit religious organization. Therefore, LCF investments are not FDIC insured bank deposit accounts. This is not an offer to sell investments or solicitation to buy. LCF will offer and sell its securities only in states where authorized. The offer is made solely by LCF's offering circular. Investors should carefully read the offering circular, which more fully describes associated risks. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Thursday, August 3rd. We're studying Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 to 17 with Pastor Vance Becker. He is an LCMS missionary to Kenya, serving as theological educator at Nima Lutheran College in Matango, Kenya. Pastor Becker, prior to the break, we were going through this section in which Solomon speaks about all the things that he has amassed. We talked about the trouble of slavery that he mentions there, and he continues just listing things as his possessions, herds, flocks, more than anyone in Jerusalem, silver, gold, singers, concubines, all kinds of possessions. Take us into verses 7 and 8. Okay. Um, Yes, before we looked at, you know, pleasure itself, we looked at projects and the enjoyment that comes from those. Um, and and uh, now we're looking at stuff. And I would just make a, you know, a couple of personal comments. One about projects. I enjoy doing projects. But as one of the commentaries I looked at noted, you enjoy when you're doing them. And when you're done, it's like, okay, they don't have lasting, the enjoyment doesn't last so long. It's enjoyment to do them, and when you're just done, that's great, but then, okay, now I want to do something else. And the same is true of stuff. I, I have hoarding tendencies. My wife notes uh, I inherited that, um, for, didn't fall far from the tree. But the stuff of life, that also is not where the, the value is. And uh, one of the things, as I'm getting older, one of the things I'm aware of is, maybe you've heard this already, you know your kids don't want your stuff, you collect all this stuff and you think, boy, I'll give you one example. 
when I was in seminary, I bought all these books. Boy, I had books, books, books. And I thought, you know, when I retire, I'm going to sell these books and I'm going to have piles of money because they get more expensive all the time. You, you know this. You know where I'm going. No one wants my books. When I came here, I had to beg people to adopt my babies. <laughs> yeah. And, well, okay, so back to Solomon, uh, his stuff, uh, flocks, uh, herds and flocks, okay, herds as big animals, flocks, smaller animals, more than anybody else, silver and gold, uh, you know, silver, he had so much, silver wasn't even valuable, the, the, it tells us, you know, was, everything was golden. Um, and in those he got from kings and provinces, apparently, a lot of this is from his trade with, with other kings um, th that he's gathered this. Uh, he's got singers, men and women, concubines. Those also possibly gotten from other kingdoms that he's in contact with or that are, are part of his larger empire. Um, this word for singers, it's not that important, but just interesting to me, uh, could be, tr it's, it has to do with music. I've seen that it could be translated musical instruments. Um, and uh, you know, he values, you know, he's he's a collector of of musical things. And okay, they didn't have recordings in, but a collector of singers uh, of music for his own enjoyment is also used in worship. You know, men and women singers. Mm, then we get concubines. Okay, well, that's sort of going back to sort of like slaves. Well, you know, that's okay. That the Bible does specifically say is wrong. That also, unfortunately, was very common even throughout the kingdom of Israel. Uh, quite common for Solomon. He doesn't mention it here, but uh, those wives also and concubines, that's what got him into a lot of trouble. Uh, he, you know, in this book, he talks about what's really true and wise. It's one thing to have true wisdom. It's another to apply it to yourself. Um, I'll give you one example. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a, uh, a marriage resource called Prepare Enrich. Um, there was a guy in Minnesota where I used to serve that, that developed that based on research. And his research found that living together before marriage uh, is actually detrimental to marriage. It, it, it's, it's, it's not helpful. It's bad. And, and I was at a workshop he did once where he talked about he had these research assistants working on this. And so I asked him, I said, oh, when your research assistants discovered this, did they themselves say, I will not have sex before marriage? And he says, no. <laughs> it's one thing to know it. It's another thing to apply it. Um, Solomon's very wise, but he doesn't apply it. He's got all these concubines, and that's, that's going to cause him a lot of trouble. And yes, these are the kind of things that delight children uh, of men. Um, because children of men are still childish in their thinking and in their behaving. Um, so as Solomon continues his discussion of where he went and what he did, he says that he became great. He surpassed all who were before him in Jerusalem. He retained his wisdom. He didn't withhold anything that his eyes desired. Keep talking to us about what Solomon is explaining here concerning pleasure. Yes. Um, this, this desire, um, his eye, the original language says it's sort of like his eyes ask for things. <laughs> uh, and, you know, that is sort of the way it is. We, we see things that, that catches our attention and, and says, hey, I, I want that. Um, now, I'm going to comment on verse 9. He compares himself to others. And, and in other places in the Bible, it does this. It says, boy, his, he was greater than anybody else in wisdom. He was greater than anybody else in riches. Uh, here is another aspect of vanity comparison, comparing yourself to others. There is no permanent real value in that. Um, he compares himself to others in Jerusalem. Um, one of the commentaries I looked at, you've heard this before, God doesn't grade on a curve. You know, comparison to others does not count to God, and it doesn't count uh, really for us either. And, and I, ha I have to say this, I think it is very common, very common, he doesn't use the term self-worth, self-value. You know, if, you, if your self-worth is based on how you compare to others, you are continually going to be working, striving, trying to, to get some by pushing others down. 
But if you have self-value in yourself, your own self-esteem, um, then you're free of that. And where does that real self-esteem come from? It comes from God's value of you. Knowing that you're a child of God, that you have intrinsic value, frees you from this trap of comparing yourself to others, uh, which is a treadmill that never ends. And I think that's one of the things that, that Solomon is noting here. Um, now, verse 10, he talks about what his eyes desired. Uh, that reminds you of another verse in the Bible, in Genesis. Uh, Eve saw that the fruit was desirable to the eyes. Um, it's appealing. You know, we cannot judge what is good and valuable based on appearances. New Testament talks about that too. It talks about judge rightly, not based on, the, on appearances. God doesn't base, judge on appearances. He knows the reality. We can judge rightly based on God's word, not appearances, but what God tells us in his word. That's going to tell us real value. Uh, and so he, he desires things. Um, he finds pleasures in his toil. Um, and I, he's talking about these projects. Yeah, I enjoy doing stuff. Uh, but that's not a lasting enjoyment. It doesn't last long beyond the finishing of what I'm doing. Because this is my reward. Uh, verse 10, this is my reward for my toil or my lot. Or um, that word there, um, it can refer to like a, a piece of inherited land. Um, what belongs to our our lot. Our lot is, is what God gives us. In fact, in uh, in the Psalms, it says, God is my portion, that is my lot, my my reward. Um, it's what's given to us. Uh, you could trans talk about this something like my 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 fate or my lot in life. Um, it's not totally fate. It it is it is what God chooses to give us. Um, and, and that's where ultimate value is um, in these things. So after that reflection in verse 10, it sounds like he's drawing now the conclusion to the thesis statement, coming back to where he started. Solomon says, I looked at it all. I considered all my hands had done the toil. Behold, it was all vanity, striving after the wind. Nothing was gained. Take us now into verse 11. Okay. No, you have to finish the sentence. Nothing is gained under the sun. Ah, that's the point. In this life, in this world. And and uh, he doesn't make it explicit, but it is implicit. That the value is not in what I do for myself. Therefore, it is in what I do for others. The value is not in what I gain for myself. It's from what God gives to me. The value is not in what to be gained under the sun. Ah, the implication is there's something beyond the sun. Um. And that's only where the value is. Um, I've talked about how the, you know, the satisfaction for work, you know, ends when you're when you're done doing the work. Um, let me look at my notes here just a bit. Um, the, the striving after wind. Uh, he sort of is piling up terms here. Vanity, striving after wind, nothing to be gained. It sort of suggests there's some disappointment here. Now I'm suggesting that as research, but boy. <laughs> This is all just worthless in, in, in more ways than one. Uh, that's too bad because, you know, I enjoy this. <laughs> this. This is fun. I enjoy this, but but no, it doesn't have any lasting value. Um, what's lasting value is recognizing what's prepared beforehand for us by God. Uh, New Testament, what book is it? Where it talks about the good works that are prepared, that God has prepared in advance for us to do. Ephesians 2. Um, thank you. Um, you know, that's that's the value. What, what we prepare for ourselves does not have value. Um, anything under the sun, because the sun itself is going to come to an end. The sun itself is part of this creation. Uh, there are things in this creation that will have lasting value, but only because of God's creation of them, God's new recreating of them. And what God does, God himself does with the things that we can do. All right. So that takes us through verse 11. And then the ESV editors make a section break there in verse 12. And it does seem that Solomon begins to change topics a little bit. As now he even says there in verse 12, I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly. So he's talked a lot about pleasure. 
Now he's changing topics. Help us to make that turn there in verse 12. Okay, so we've, yeah, we've looked at, at, at the, the physical, like, you know, the pleasure, the, the stuff, the, the activities. Now, in a sense, we're going to turn to more thoughtful things, the cerebral, uh, non, non, uh, non-concrete things, um, wisdom, madness, and folly. Now, there's three terms there. Uh, I've looked, I have limited resources here, but I'm not finding a difference between the meaning of the Hebrew term for madness and folly. So let's say we're contrasting wisdom on the one hand to madness and folly on the other hand. Um, that are those things that are just, um, you, know, you know, madness in a sense. Well, it's just stupid to think that, that these things are value. Um, and so we're comparing opposites, sort of like law and gospel, two opposites. Um, and this kind of experimenting is done not with physical experiments, but reflection. He's reflecting on them. Um, and uh, here, as he does in a couple of other places, he's showing his ultimate concern for the future, you know, ultimately. And he's saying, okay, ultimately, as we think about it, a fool and a wise man end up the same way. Um, but uh, before I go on, let me talk about verse, end of verse 12. Um, this is sort of... It's obscure to me. What can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. I'm not sure what exactly he's meaning there. Um, Bolenhagen suggests that he's thinking about, I'm not any better than the guy before me, and the guy after me is not going to be any better for me. I don't know. Do you have any insight on the end of verse 12? No, I'm not entirely sure either. What can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. I'm not entirely sure how to put that one together either. So let's just go on quickly to verse 13. Okay. Um, And so he's comparing wisdom and folly. Now, Solomon knows good and well that wisdom is better than folly. Um, And and he says that in verse 13. He says, yeah, light is better than darkness. That's true. In and of itself, wisdom is better than folly. But, But in the long run... You know, the wise person and the foolish person end up the same way. Well, okay, again, that is only under the sun. That is according to what is perceivable. Now, outside of this, we know the wisdom God gives us that, no, they don't end up the same way ultimately, but he's talking here about what is perceivable. Um, and verse 14, he, uh, he says, yeah, but wisdom does that value in itself. I love this expression. The wise person has eyes in his head. Uh, that's what the, the way the Hebrew puts it. I got it. I got to watch for an opportunity to use that sometime uh, with my students and say, you know, have some eyes in your head, <laughs> as, as opposed to the fool who walks in darkness. I don't know where his eyes are, but they're they're not in his head. They're not where they belong. Um, uh, so, and yet, in the end, he says that is okay. What's it when you die? Both of them end up dead. That's basically what he's saying. Both of them end up buried. Both of them end up with none of their stuff, with none of their accomplishments. Um, I'm trying to remember the quote. You know it. Um, the uh, Colossus. What, it, what is the quote? of the, You know the, 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 the ancient poem about the, there's this, this head, this massive head buried in the sand. Somebody built a great statue of himself. I'm the greatest there is. And nah, you're, you're just dust. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you're talking about Ozymandias, right? That one. Yeah, I've had three episodes on Ecclesiastes, and you're the third guest to bring it up. Three for three. Yeah. Uh, so, and Solomon realizes, no. And you know, here also, we've got to talk application. That is a common thing today. People think, I want to be remembered. I, I want to do something. People who don't know the truth of God, they're only immortality. And that's what people are after. They're after immortality, whether they realize it or not. Their only immortality is that their stuff continues. Okay, well, no, it's not gonna. Your kids don't want your stuff. Um, that their name, that their reputation continues. And you know what? It's not. You are going to be forgotten. Um, you know, I, th- I think about that my, with my work here. You know, people like to be like, I've even said it to my students, whether you remember me when you leave here or not, I don't care. 
I don't care if you remember me. Remember what I say about Jesus. That's what you've got to remember. Um, and because you know, people aren't going to remember me. That's what he's talking about in verse 16. Um, as of the wise, as of the soul. There's no enduring remembrance. There are great, great people, and they're, they're totally forgotten. Don't think you're, you're going to be an exception to the rule. Um, their, their immortality is in, in something else. And so then the conclusion comes, how the wise dies just like the fool. And then verse 17, So I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me for all its vanity and a striving after the wind. That's a very similar conclusion to what he had said earlier about pleasure. Yeah, here in a sense, he's answering the question that was asked in in chapter one. You know, everything seems worthless. Can everything actually be that totally worthless? And the answer is, yeah. <laughs> uh, now, he, he says here, he says, I hated life. Okay, I think we need to rightly understand the word hate. I don't think he's miserable with his life. You know, in the New Testament, Jesus talks about... Um, Anybody who follows me must hate his, you know, mother, father, wife, children, family. Um, it, it, it's a comparative, I would say, um, not in the sense of miserable, not hate in the sense of I want what is bad for you. That's the way we often use hate. Um, he hates life. And when he talks about life, he's talking about life in this world. Life in this world, ah, it's disgusting. Why? Because it is it's evil to me. It means that, how is life evil to me? Well, not my, not everything is spiritual life, but I'm going to die. You know, in that sense, everything in life, because it ends in death, is evil to me. It is grievous. And that is true under the sun. So again, doesn't take into account, it's by, it's by what's not said. Ah, it's what's beyond the sun. The shadow of death ruins everything, even wisdom. And that's what he's saying. Even wisdom is ruined by this shadow of death that hangs over us. Um, and, uh, and so he doesn't yet acknowledge it. But you know, why, why is death? The wages of sin. The wages of sin is death. Um, and and uh, so that's where the evil comes from. And that's why all of these things that are good things of God, all these things we've been talking about, Wisdom, uh, projects, uh, you know, the, the forest and all of those things, uh, music, gold, silver, wine itself, pleasure, all good gifts from God. Uh, in and of themselves, however, there is not the value. It is only uh, in, in what God gives them to us for, and that, that applies to life itself. Life itself does not have value outside of the value that God gives it, uh, that God put on it by buying us back with the blood of Jesus, by the values that God has for us. Now, I know this is going to take us beyond our text for today, because that is where Solomon ends in what we've read so far. But draw that out further for us right now, so that we don't wind up in despair from a text like this. These are good gifts of God. The fact that God gives them makes them good. So how do we take what Solomon has given us today and apply it positively so that we see where there isn't the vanity, so we can see where there is meaning, and it's not just a striving after the wind? Well, I think we have to go back to um, what I commented at the very beginning, law and gospel. Solomon the preacher is giving us law and gospel in this book, and in this chapter, it's law. The law is good. Now, the law accuses, the law condemns, but the law is good. Why? Because the law points us to God, points us to our need for God. And I think that's the, that's the good and the value in this. He shows us what's not good so that we can see um, more clearly what is good. Now, I'll use an example. When I teach class, a lot of times I'll talk about this and I'll say, and I'll kind of, okay, it's not this. For example, uh, symbolics class or different classes. This is good, good Lutheran, you know, this, not this. Um, and I use this example. 
I had a piece of chalk, and here we have, in that classroom, I had a, a blackboard and a piece of chalk. I used, I wrote something on the chalkboard. I wrote the same thing on the wall next to the chalkboard. The wall is white. I said, it's the same thing. It's the same chalk. It's there. Can you see it? No. Why not? Because the contrast. The only way you can see what is good and right and true and beautiful is in contrast to the black, to the darkness. Light is only seen in contrast to darkness. And so Solomon is helping us to see the light by showing us the darkness. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's showing us the chalk, the blackboard. So that now he can, we can draw on it with the chalk and the white and say, ah, now I can see clearly. Because until you see the darkness, you're not going to see the light clearly. Yeah, that's a really helpful illustration, Pastor Becker. Now, we have about three minutes left here on the morning. Reflecting on this text from Ecclesiastes 2, help us to see how we can see Jesus in a text like this. We know that all Scripture points us to Jesus. So how does this section of Ecclesiastes 2 point us to Jesus? Help us to wrap things up today. You know, that that's a good question. <laughs> and and especially if you're going to use this as a, as a text. In homiletics class, one of the things I teach my kids, I don't know if you know Rev Rosso, he talks about gospel handles. You have to find Jesus in every text. And sometimes with a text like this, boy, that's difficult. What is the connection? One of the ways that you, that you uh, connect Jesus to texts where you don't find him clearly is, what we need, he provides. Here we see what we need, that is value. And um, these things don't provide it. Where is it? It is Jesus. Jesus is waiting to provide it. Um, another is the, the good that is done in the text uh, is done, is like what Jesus does for us. Solomon has a lot of projects that he does. Uh, you know what? Our value is that we are the project. We are God's project. We are Jesus' project, and what he builds in us, that is where there is real value. Um, and, and uh, you know, yes, we're going to die, and that's where he ends up. We're going to die, and that keeps, but the connection with Jesus is he's going to give us life. That's another way to connect gospel where you don't find it. The need in the text, that is the need for something beyond life, this life, that is provided by Jesus because Jesus comes back to life and Jesus brings us back to life. And those, so those are some ways that Jesus connects. Uh, you know, if you were preaching on this, you could connect Jesus to, to even a text like this. Pastor Vance Becker is an LCMS missionary to Kenya. He serves as a theological educator at Nima Lutheran College in Matango, Kenya. He's been helping us today to study Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 to 17. Pastor Becker... Thanks for being our guest today. You're most welcome. God's blessings to all you do. Solomon searched out all manner of pleasure, physical pleasure, building projects, aesthetics. But here in this life under the sun, Solomon only found vanity, a striving after the wind. He sought out wisdom, and yet again he found vanity, a striving after the wind. In this life under the sun, death is that great equalizer, as we will hear him speak more about in this book. And yet, for us who live not only under the sun in the sky, but under the Son of God, Jesus Christ, we know that our lives do have meaning. Jesus is the one who has conquered that great equalizer, death, and Jesus promises us resurrection on the last day. He sets us free right now in this life to live not only for ourselves or for our own pleasure or for our own wisdom, but to use his gifts in service to the neighbor. God be praised for the meaning that Jesus gives to our lives. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about Ecclesiastes chapter 2, please send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.